Honorable Vice Rector for Research, Innovation and Postgraduate Studies, Professor Eugene Kluter. Our guest of honor this evening, Professor Meshak Aziokpono and his wife Filumina. Our University Council Member, Gretchen Arangis. USB Director, Professor Piet Nodier. Colleagues from the USB, colleagues from the faculty, colleagues from the university, students and especially those many students who are listening to us this evening live via streaming all over our continent, a real expression of the African agenda of the USP and our faculty. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a wonderful evening for the faculty, but also for me personally, to have the opportunity to introduce for his inaugural lecture, Professor Meshak Aziok Pono, someone who is not only a colleague, but also a friend of many years, and for a brief period, my student. On my email directory, I have correspondence between myself and Meshak uh, all the way back to 2005. But we met a few years before that as two young econometricians involved in the African Econometric Society. We shared then, as we still do, an interest in time series econometrics, especially where it concerns the financial sector and monetary policy. He impressed me early on with his earnest scholarship and his friendly demeanor. At the time of our initial acquaintance, Meshak was a lecturer in Lesotho, and his academic career has since taken him to Rhodes, and finally, and very happily, to us here in Stellenbosch. But the story began in Nigeria, Meshak's home country. From Nigeria, he went to Benin for his bachelor's degree in economics and, and econometrics at the University of Benin, and then he returned to Nigeria for his master's degree at the uh, very highly esteemed University of Ibadan. He would later complete his PhD at the University of the Free State. It was a great privilege for me to be a co-supervisor of his PhD thesis under the main supervision of Professor Philippe Berger. It is a fantastic thesis uh, on the depth of financial integration and its effects on financial development and economic performance of the Southern African Customs Union countries. And this thesis was justly rewarded with the Economic Society of South Africa's Founders Medal for the best PhD of the year. Professor Aziok Pono is an internationally recognized researcher and has published widely in scholarly journals and in books. And he has a very large number of conference contributions locally and internationally. He has collaborated with the well-known African Economic Research Consortium and has also been a visiting scholar at the International Monetary Fund in Washington. Meshak is an excellent lecturer, not just in the lecture hall, but especially also in curriculum development and in program administration. He carried a very heavy burden at Rhodes, where he developed an important and unique master's program in financial markets. And we were really very fortunate that he joined the USP to help build our development finance program, which has become a very prominent part of our program offering. And personally, Meshak is one of the nicest guys I have the privilege to know. And he and Filomena are two of the most generous hosts one can hope for. Meshak, your graduation in Bloemfontein some years ago is already one of my fondest memory as an academic. But this evening will be better when I get the opportunity to listen to your inaugural lecture as a professor at Stellenbosch University. We are your eager audience. Thank you, uh, Professor Depressi, for the introduction. The Vice Rector, Research, Innovation, and 
Postgraduate Studies, Professor Eugene Pluto, the Dean of Economics and Management Science Faculty, Professor Stan Duplessy, the Director of the USB, Professor Pete Nodé, family, friends, and students that are present. It is my pleasure to deliver this inaugural lecture on behalf of the Faculty of Management Sciences to this great university, and it, I do so with all humility. The theme of the inaugural lecture, as you can see, is the changing paradigms of financial sector policies and regulations in Africa, lessons from the past. When you think in terms of the, the history of financial sector policy in Africa, one of the things that you will observe is a key political economic question that is often at the center of the debate. And that question is, what is the role of the state? And what should it leave for the private sector without any interference where possible? And historically, there are two extreme views that dominate this discussion. And these views are, the first one is the classical and the neoclassical economic school of thought that was initiated, inspired by Adam Smith, one of the founders of economic thought. He stressed the role of the state that there should be minimal interference by the state to the, in the economy, and that when the market functions without the interference of the state, it functions better. On the other end of that view, or the other extreme, is the Keynesian school of thought that was also inspired by Lord Minna Keynes during the Great Depression of 1929 to 30s. During this period, it became apparent that the invisible hand that was advocated by the classical economists that would help to solve the problems of the economy could not really play that role. Hence, he advocated for the role of the state. Indeed, he mentions that in the presence of market failure, the role of an effective government is not only necessary, but may be sufficient. So over time, these two views have dominated the debate on how to regulate and how, what policy should drive the financial sector globally. But the question is, why is the financial sector so important that we will devote attention to it? Well, there are a number of reasons. But when we think in terms of the function that is performed by the financial sector, for instance, without the financial sector, we cannot have a payment system. Just imagine what it will look like when there is no payment system. Basically, we will be in a batter system. We are, for you to have a glass of water, you must, and if your service is a professor, you must look for somebody who needs a service of a professor that at the same time has water to offer. <laughs> you can just imagine the problem that you will face, the, what we call the double coincidence of want. But with the payment system, it becomes very easy for transaction to take place. And not only that, it enables people to specialize. Hence, you can innovate. By virtue of that, productivity will be increased and it can lead to economic growth. In addition to that, one of the key functions of the financial system is that it helps to mobilize savings. Typically, what happens is that savings are held at the hands of individuals. You can just imagine if all individuals were to hold their savings in their pocket or bury them in the, or, uh, under the pillow or whatever form, it will not be useful for productive purposes in the economy. So the financial system played the role of helping to mobilize these savings and put them in a financial saving form that can be invested. And by so doing, contribute as a critical factor of production, capital, for, to lead to growth and development. The financial system also helped to increase allocation of capital, improve the efficiency of allocation, because they can screen, they have developed the expertise to screen uh, the good project, distinguish a good project from a bad one, 
they are able to allocate the fund that is available to the most productive uses. And as a result of that, create economic activity and lead to growth. So without any doubt, from a theoretical point of view, it is very clear that the financial system is very pivotal to economic growth and development. From the point of research, one of the ways research in the field of uh, finance has been done is to cast the question as if, if the financial sector is not important, they want to look at the causality, the relationship between financial system development and economic growth. As if, if that variable called financial sector is not important, then you can in, uh, neglect it. But in my view, that is a wrong way of looking at it. Because the question is not whether the financial system is important, but it's the question of how to manage it to ensure that we achieve the desired result of promoting economic growth and development and ensuring the stability of the financial system. That is the core issue, not the question of whether it is important or not. So for countries in Africa, where the financial growth and development appear to have eluded the continent, as we are going to see shortly, it is apparently important that we find the right ways to ensure that to manage, we manage the financial system to get that desired result of stimulating the growth, but at the same time ensuring that the system is stable. Now let's look at the, a bit of the context of Africa to help us appreciate why the role of the financial system is absolutely important. If you look at the history of Africa, you will realize that the 1960s went down in history as a decade of political independence of most African countries. In 1960 alone, 17 countries attained independence. Within that decade, 32, that from 1960 to 1969, 72 countries, so 32 countries attained their political independence. And by the end of the 70 decade, most countries in Africa had attained independence. But what was the situation when they attained political independence? You will be surprised to know that virtually only very few countries had per capita GDP that were up to 200 US dollars. Most of them were far less. Think of the picture. Some of them, I know it's quite uh, tiny. Some of them, like Rwanda, was just $38 per capita GDP. Others, 48, 52, and so on. If you see a country like um, uh, Egypt, 169, and so on. So you can see that the country on the continent were not only very poor, the resources available were very limited. When we also look at the poverty, one way we can measure that is the number of people, the, as a ratio of the total population, that live on a dollar 25 cent a day. If you think in terms of what was the situation in 1981, we have 51% of the population live with a dollar and 25 cent a day. You can just imagine what was the situation in the 60s and in the 70s when the country gained independence. So it shows to us how poor the continent was. But does it mean that the situation had changed dramatically? Not really. If you think in terms of the year 2010, 48% of the population on the continent still remain living with $1.25 a day. What of other aspects of development like education? In 1960, when many of these countries gained independence, only 6.1% of the population had attained primary school education, graduated. Then 1.4% secondary school education, and 0.2% has attained a tertiary education. Well, even as of 2010, the situation has not improved significantly. We still have a meager 18.4 percent that have uh, primary school education, and 1.4 uh, of secondary school education, and 1.3, sorry, the secondary school education is wrong there, but 1.3 of tertiary education. So, what does that help us to see? It shows us that. The continent was not only poor, but in terms of the level of development, 
it was very rudimentary. We also look at the situation of roads as at that time, only 18.8% of total roads that are available on the sub-Saharan African countries were paved as of 2009. So you can just imagine if we cast our mind back to what was the case when they gained independence. What about poverty, like I have mentioned? If you look at the picture of poverty, not only that it was so high at the beginning, it actually got worse over time. And it has only decreased marginally as of 2010. I have talked about the education. Because of these monumental developmental challenges that the continent faced, many policy intervention have been developed, have been propagated to ensure that this problem can be resolved. And today, we are focusing on the financial sector policies and regulation on the continent. When one look at the history, we can group one of the guests that is saying. Uh, sorry about that. <laughs> so if we look at the history, we can divide the policy that have been put in place into three phases. We have the one we, I will refer to as the pre-Washington consensus phase, and then we have the the Washington consensus phase and then the post-Washington consensus phase. If you think in terms of the era of the pre-Washington consensus phase, that was the era that was characterized by what the neoliberal orthodox economies would label financial repression. This was a time when, as you will recall, the Keynesian view dominated. And indeed, many of the institutions that were built, including the central banks, in the countries when they gained independent were supported to promote developmental agenda. So they were more of developmental central banks. And the state were fully involved in all aspects of the economy, including industrial firms and financial firms, like owning banks and controlling the interest rate that is used, and the, even the ownership of the banks. Many a times, the private banks that were in existence were nationalized and taken over by the state. So during this period, the challenge that then happened is that whereas the banks, the, the institutions, where the, the policy of the government was aimed at mobilizing resources to finance the, the developmental state of that time so that it built the state to create jobs and also to help to develop the state, the challenge that the countries faced, well, the financial sector faced was that because of the controlled interest rate, individuals that had money were no longer able to save domestically. Rather, those who had money preferred to save abroad, or they choose to consume. By virtue of that, the level of saving that is being mobilized, which is supposed to be one of the key functions of the financial system, was retarded or repressed. So the whole idea of financial repression. And because the available fund was limited, by implication, the investment that can be made available also was limited. By virtue of that, credit rationing became the order of the day. Only those who, are politically con who were politically connected could have access to loan. And by virtue of that, it also became the case that if you want to have loan, you have to bribe some of the officials of the state. Hence, corruption became the order. Because of the problem that arose due to this policy, which had been criticized by the neoliberal economies, then a new agenda was promote, promoted, especially towards the end of the 1970s, and led by the IMF and the World Bank and even the Federal Reserve SEM in the US, a new agenda, which is now called the Washington Consensus, was put in place. What is the whole idea of this? It advocated a market-oriented policy with a set of generic market-oriented uh, 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 policies with fiscal discipline, 
trade and exchange liberalization and financial sector liberalization agenda. So at this point, the policies were aimed at ensuring that individuals can own a bank. Capital can flow easily. And interest rate will be directly be within the purview of the banking sector, rather than the government determining what exactly should be the rate that will be charged for a particular loan. But the problem was that during that period, there was so much hope that the liberalization of the financial system, the liberalization of the system, would bring about so much good. According to Mackinnon and Shaw, who were one of the advocates of this agenda, who came up with an hypothesis now we know as Mackinnon and Shaw hypothesis, it was argued that by liberalizing the interest rate, the interest rate will now be market competitive. Hence, individuals will be able to deposit money in the bank. Hence, we'll be able to mobilize a huge financial savings. With mobilization of financial savings, it then will lead to more resources or funds for investment. And with more investment, then it will lead to increase in productivity, growth, and then employment will increase. So there was so much hope. But unfortunately, after many years of implementation of this, by 1993, most countries in sub-Saharan Africa, indeed in Africa, had adopted a form of social adjustment program or the other. What then happened? We realized that growth did not come as was expected. In fact, there was so much unemployment, there was so much problem within the economy that it became the case that critics begin to refer to that period as a lost decade. One of the prominent economists, who was a World Bank uh, noted economist, William Easterly, uh, who was actually ejected from the World Bank because of his strong view against this Washington consensus um, uh, policies, argued that, based on his research, that the 90s and the 80s were a lost decade in the developing world, including in Africa. And the argument was that without those poli uh, Washington consensus policies, would the world, have, the developing world, have been worse off? Many would argue, and I personally would argue, as I will show shortly, that I do not believe the, country, the countries in Africa would have been worse off if they had continued with the earlier policy that they had. Because of the criticism that were levied against the Washington consensus of, uh, policies, what then happened, a new, what appeared to be a new consensus have now emerged, what we now call as the post-Washington consensus uh, phase. What basically does this entail? It was not a total abandonment of the Washington consensus phase where market was seen as the order of the day. So it still recognized the market as core. However, it also recognized the fact that there could be large market failures within the market. It recognized the role of the state that the government have a critical role to play. But on the other hand, it also recognized the fact that the government should not try to do too much, as it was the case with the pre Washington Consensus era. So here is a, kind, a case of a balanced view between the, the Keynesian view of state dominating everything and the classical view of market, free market only. What was the outcome during this era, this three era that we mentioned? The reality is that during the pre- <coughs> During the pre uh, Washington Consensus era, when the countries gained independence, automatically, because that was the order of the day, the Keynesian view was the dominant view around the world. Many of them followed that. And the state were able to garner the little resources they, were, they had, and they invested it as much as possible in, in the state. Infrastructure were built. In fact, if you look at many African countries, you will see that most of the roads that are constructed that are there now, that are not able to, the current government are not able to maintain, were built in the 60s and in the 70s because of these resources that were mobilized. And besides that, when we think in terms of the growth, so if you look at the, the, the growth record here, the 60s and the 70s, you will see that the, country, the countries grew 3.3 in the 60 decades, in the 70 decades, 4.4. But when it comes to the 80s decades, when the, the structural adjustment program, part of the, the, the uh, Washington Consensus Policy were implemented, the growth slided to 1.4. And 
and by the 90s, it was only two. But as we move to the new era of the new post uh, Washington Consensus era, what then happened? The growth resumed again. That's what we are saying. Again, if you look at in terms of return per capita GDP, if you think in terms of what was the case during the, the, the pre Washington Consensus era, the per capita GDP in return had grown to $949. But with the introduction of the structural adjustment program, the market oriented policies, what happened? There was a significant drop in the per capita GDP. Indeed, we are only able to catch up now to the level of the 70s only within 2010 and the current period of this GDP. So the question is that will we have been worse off if we had pursued the same policy that was there in the 70s? Not likely. That is my view. But let's look at, with specific reference to the financial sector, what happened. <clears throat> if you think in terms of the principle of the 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 Washington Consensus, the structural adjustment program liberalized, and as argued by Mackin and Shaw, when you do that, the financial system will be able to mobilize more savings. And therefore, there will be more savings, credit to lend to the so there will be more investment. And let's look at two indicators to measure that. One indicator is the amount of deposit that the banks are able to mobilize as a ratio of GDP. So if you think in terms of what was happening, of course, in the 60s, the deposit was here, and in the 70s, it was here. But you could see a pattern of growth that was taking place. But as soon as the structural adjustment program, the regional policy came into effect, this started decreasing. And overall, if you think of the whole sub-Saharan African country, you will realize that the ability of the bank to mobilize deposit remains still very low. At the peak, it's only 22% of GDP. When you think of other regions, like the European uh, Euro area having 78% and others. What about credit as a ratio of GDP by the commercial banks and other financial institutions? If you think in terms of the pattern, again, during the era of the 60s and the 70s, you will realize a, a, a growth that was taking place. But as soon as the social adjustment program policy came into place, there was a drop that took place. Can we really argue that the social adjustment program or the financial liberalization policies that took place, which were advocated, had helped to change situation for the better? There is no clear evidence to support that. Rather, it is more logical to argue that it actually led to a decline in the financial sector and in the economy. I think I will skip this. Let me move to one slide that I find very interesting. One way we can also gauge the performance of the financial system is the number of financial crises, systemic crises that took place in the country, in the countries. So if you look at between 1960 and 2011, altogether there were 131 financial, systemic financial crises that occurred and in 47 countries. Now here is the picture. In the, 70, in the 60s, there was none. In the 70s, there was only one. In the 80s, as soon as the financial liberalization policy came into place, the number of financial crises increased to 35 in 18 countries. By the 1990s, 92 financial crises and in 26 countries. And by 2000, in the 2000s, only one. And in 2010, downward, only two in one country. Basically, this is Nigeria. This to this or that to that <laughs> happen. Now, if you if you if you look at the if you look at this picture, this uh, if you look at this picture, one can also argue that when it comes to financial liberalization, the the Washington Consensus era. In terms of promoting growth, there is no clear evidence that did promote growth. Rather, there was a decline in growth. In terms of mobilizing savings and allocating credit, there was a decline. But what still? it destabilized the financial system by creating so much crisis. And what is not worthy about this crisis is that all of them were individual country specific. It was not because of contagion. So it's not like because America, there was a crisis in America, then it spread to the other one. Each of these countries were having their independent country specific crisis because of the policies. So we can say categorically that the financial, six, the, the financial policy of the Washington Consensus, which 
basically at the financial liberalization with market oriented policy created so much problem for the economies where they are. So overall, one can see say that the policy in terms of the outcome, the pre Washington consensus policy were far better than the Washington consensus era. And as the Washington consensus era policy were being abandoned and a more if the new consensus policies are now being adopted, the growth begin to kick in and credit allocation begin to increase as well as deposit mobilization and the number of financial crises begin to drop. So we can say that it was actually good that the financial policies, the policies of those era were abandoned. Now, I come to my take on the issue. You recall the key political economic question is what should be the role of the state? And what should the state leave for the private sector without interference? This picture, in order to help us appreciate my take on the matter, I'm going to use this framework to demonstrate my position. Now, if you look at this graph, you will see that from this point A, we can virtually put all economic unit or economic activity within the economy and line them up in a continuum from this end to this end. And if we use two metrics to assess the, the how viable is each economic unit or economic activity for financing, we can use the risk level or the cost recovery level. So we have two curves that shows that what it shows basically is that any business that lies at this end here, the risk level is so high and the cost recovery is so low that they are not viable for any business in terms of financing, be it a state government-owned financial institution or a private-owned financial institution. Typically, at this, age, at this stage, you need fiscal transfers or grants to be able to support any business or economic and activity that is taking place in that sector. On the other hand, when we come to this other end, the other end, we have the private sector. In terms of the cost recovery, you can virtually recover close to 100% using all the mechanism of managing risk and uh, ensuring that you allocate risk. You can recover close to 100% of the cost and the risk is close to zero. That is a sector that is appealing to the private sector. So we have the banks, the stock market, the bond market, the unit trust, the private equity fund playing a role in that sector. But we have the middle space where typically we have the micro, small, medium enterprises, the infrastructure projects, the smallholder farmers, the agribusiness, the first generation enterprises, the rural dwellers, the low income earners, where they are. This group of people, they do not have they are not so poor to deserve a grant or a fiscal transfer. On the other hand, they are not so rich to be able to attract loan or financing from the private sector. Now, what would happen if there is no intervention? This is what we typically refer to as a missing middle, where there is a market failure. With this market failure, with us state interfer uh, uh, intervention, you this middle, missing middle will be totally neglected. Here is the point. If you think in terms of the level of development in Africa, where the market institutions are very underdeveloped, and where the amount of credit that the private sector are able to mobilize is very minimal, and there is no proper, uh, the, the legal system is weak. At the same time, the property right is ill-defined, what is the point? We will expect a situation where this zone that is attracted to the private sector will be very small. On the other hand, this middle space will be very wide. So if you have such a wide middle space and you have a very narrow sector that the private sector will intervene, can play a role, without government intervention, you can imagine that the economy cannot move forward. So there is need for intervention. So it makes sense if you think in terms of the post-independent uh, uh, policy of the state that there was the state embarked on so much uh, intervention 
of only banks regulating uh, the banking sector to be able to attract the deposit in such a way that they will use it to finance industrial projects. It makes sense to some extent. But here's my take in terms of what was wrong with that. The fact that there were a number of private banks, private financial institutions that were nationalized was a wrong move during that period. Because the fact that such institutions were there to play a role, this space would have actually expanded with time as they learned by doing as, as such institutions are being developed. So what would have been better for the state to do at that time was to encourage and to promote the development of the private sector so that the private sector can continue to grow. On the other hand, it is obvious that, obvious that the private sector, because of the limited capacity that it has then, will not be able to cater for the whole economy. Hence, the state will also have to play a role. So the role of the state would have then complemented that of the private sector. And the pool of funds that would have been available to finance the economy would have been bigger than the state taking over everything and managing it wrongly. Just like it will be argued that the state was not adequately equipped, it was backward, there was no uh, adequate institution for the private sector to function properly, it will, the same argument holds for the state. Many of the state institutions were also poorly managed, managed because the human capital development, as we have seen, was very low. So neither the state nor the, the private sector was adequately equipped as at that time to be able to show that everything. So therefore, it would have been better for two of them to manage the, the system, hence be able to mobilize as much as possible the fund that's available and lend to the economy. Now, let's try to appreciate my position on this matter. So given the situation, where is the, what should be the role of the state? You would agree with me that, as it is up to now, African countries are still underdeveloped. There's no doubt about it. And if they are still underdeveloped, the, most of the market institution that makes the market to thrive are still also underdeveloped. We do not have much of the credit bureaus, uh, right credit uh, reference uh, bureaus that will help the private sector to function to that will minimize the information asymmetry problem we do not also have efficient legal system, and so many of those problems are still there. And most of the businesses that we are having are still the ones that we have in the middle space here. So if we have that, there's still a role for the private sector, and there's still a role for the government. But there's, the reality is that there is a space for the private sector. So the question is, what should be the role of the state, and what should be the role of the private sector? My argument is this, like the new consensus is trying to argue, the state should not interfere here at all. So the idea of nationalizing, as many will want to argue, should not come into place. Where, wherever a private sector is playing a role, let the private sector continue. So in this space, see what I call that space, where the private sector is playing, the role that the government will be playing will be regulation, and supervision. And there are a, a whole range of regulatory instruments and products that can be used. The Basel Accord is very important. In my lecture, I atomize a number of areas that can be used to address this area. So regulation is very, very important. But in addition to regulation and monitoring or supervision that need to take place here, there is also the need for the government to promote market incentive those institutions that will enable the market to thrive, to flourish, such as good, well-functioning commercial courts that are empowered to be able to discharge on their duty. In other words, they can enforce contracts because without the ability of a court to enforce contract, the private sector will be handicapped. Besides that, the national IDs that are linked to the credit bureau should be promoted and be developed within the economy. Because when those ones are functioning, the information asymmetry problem that make it difficult for the private sector to thrive will be minimized. And with that, the private sector will begin to expand. And what will then happen is that this curve will then move inward, and the middle space will now begin to shrink. So in terms of intervention, in this region, C column, basically, the role of the government should be create appropriate market institution 
support them, and regulate and supervise the financial institution within that space. So that those institutions can function effectively and be able to innovate without causing instability. That should be the focus. On the other hand, the state can also play a role within this. No matter the intervention that the state will play here in terms of regulation creating the incentive, given the state of development on the continent at the moment, we cannot expect that the private sector will be able to take on all the roles of financing the economy. No. Many of these institutions, that, many of these businesses, enterprises that are here within the middle space will still be, may not be able to act, uh, access finance from the private sector. So what is required is for the state to intervene. And typically, there are two approaches in terms of principle that the state can follow. One of those principles is to create incentive to attract the private sector to finance in this middle space by helping to reduce the risk and the transaction costs that often scare the private sector from coming to the middle space. Two of such instruments that can be used is one of them is credit guarantee scheme. A credit guarantee scheme will occur such that the, the government institution will provide the guarantee where the private firms, such as these uh, businesses, do not have the collateral required. They can provide a guarantee. In case of default, we will pay. But the actual warehousing of the credit, the risk, is by the private sector. And I did not demonstrate it fully in this presentation, but in the paper it is demonstrated. If you look at the deposit that is mobilized relative to the credit that is advanced, you will realize that there is excess liquidity on the continent. So with excess liquidity, it is viable for the government to introduce credit guarantee scheme that will enable the private sector to use those excess liquidity that is not being used utilize now because of the fear of risk and the transaction costs of moving into the middle space. So that is one of them. The second one is public-private partnership. Where in financing infrastructure projects, for instance, the private sector and the public sector can partner in financing, in which case the government or the state will share part of the risk, which will make it attractive for the state, for, sorry, for the private sector, to be able to invest in such infrastructure. By so doing, the risk is shared and you'll be able to mobilize, be able to uh, mobilize some of the finances that is available in the private sector. In addition to these two uh, roles that the state can play, the private sector also have incentive to play a role. The reality is this, if you think in terms of this middle, this sector C that the private sector is playing, because of the limited amount of number of businesses that operate in that area, there's so much competition among the, the financial institutions that play in that area. By implication, the profit that is realized is being reduced. The margin is increasingly being reduced. What does, what does that mean? As we know, the private sector is purely concerned about the profit, unlike the development finance institutions. Now, if the private sector is concerned about profit and the margin is being eroded because of competition, if they do not move out of that space, then eventually many of them will go out of business. So there is incentive for them to move into this middle space. And how can they do so? Through financial innovation. And we are beginning to see an example of that happening. A typical example is Capitec in South Africa that have used technology to move into a space that is typically excluded and by so doing have been able to mobilize deposits that made it now this fourth largest bank in South Africa, overtaking one of the previous one, uh, Nedbank. So by following those type of example with innovation, we can be rest assured that the banking sector can move into that space. The reality is there are so many opportunities here in the middle space. And the profit, the returns are also very high. So all that the banks need to be thinking of or the financial institution in this, uh, the private one need to do is to become innovative. We, have, we can also cite the example of the, the mobile money. I remember uh, my colleague, Professor Jassy, dwell on that and uh, actually explain the extent to which the mobile money has grown in the East African region and is spreading. 
You can just imagine how much deposit, how much resources that are being mobilized through that. That is innovation. So if the private financial sector are innovative, that will help to increase, expand their, this zone and reduce the middle space. As a result of that, the finances that will be available in the economy will be more. So, what can we take from this? If you think of the story that we have talked about, you realize that the history of Africa has been affected by the changing paradigms of development policies. When it was in vogue that government should dominate, African countries also follow the same pattern. And to the point that even the role that the private sector was supposed to be playing, they uh, took it over by nationalizing both industrial firms and financial firms. The truth is that change will continue to occur. And African countries will continue to be affected by the winds of change around the world. Policymakers and political economists will be swayed according to the winds of change of the time and also the, according to their own personal leanings. Nevertheless, the key question of the role that the state and the private sector will play in the financial system will remain, and it will be answered differently. So in the pre washington consensus, the answer was more state. During the washington consensus, it was private sector only. Now, post washington consensus, it was a balance. Very soon, a new paradigm may come. No one answer will be absolutely right or wrong at any time. That is the truth. There will be some benefit. There will be some cost to whatever policy. But the point is that regulators, sorry, no, no set of generic policies and regulation will fit all situations and countries. So the whole idea of having a prescribed generic policy, as it was during the, the Washington Consensus, will not work. The pace of bad policies will be fed by the citizen and not so often by the proponents of those policies. Therefore, policy maker, mo makers must be wise to evaluate carefully each policy proposal against their environmental, country, and project-specific realities. No matter where it comes from or who the advocates are, let it come from the World Bank, as it was in the two, the previous eras, or let it come from the Federal Reserve System of America, or any other purpose for that matter. They need to evaluate them. To avoid the disastrous path of the past, governments in Africa must be committed to investing in capacity building and development in policy and scenario analysis and evaluation. As the world becomes more technologically smarter and more intricately linked, the complexity of future challenges and policy proposal will soar. Lagging behind in developing the right skills and capacity to deal with and manage these issues will only spell disaster for the lagging countries. And I hope efforts will not be too late or too little too late. I would like to end the, my uh, lecture by thanking a few people who have made my life very uh, a, a pleasant one. <laughs> First, I want to thank the, the management of this great university for giving me the opportunity to be here. I, was, uh, I wouldn't say I have not enjoyed my stay in this university. I have really enjoyed it. So I want to thank the university. Then the Dean of the Faculty of Economics and Management Sciences, first the former Dean, who saw it fit to appoint me, Professor uh, Juan uh, de Villiers, and the current Dean, uh, Professor uh, Stan Duplessis, who has been a long time friend. And as you said, we've been friends for a very long time before he became my supervisor. And he has become a mentor. And we, I, I don't think we relate as students lecturer, we relate as friends, and I really appreciate that. And for him also believing in me is really something that I cherish very much in my, in my career. And the former director of USB, Professor Ian Smith, 
he has been a mentor, and I really, I really appreciate what he has done so much. Uh, I want to thank him very much. Even though he's not here, he couldn't make it because he sent an email. Uh, I think he's having a few uh, uh, cold. So I really want to thank him. And the current director, Professor Pete Nodi, I really, uh, I would say you are the best boss I have ever had. <laughs> <laughs> and when I say it, I will, I will, I, I'm saying it with all sincerity. That is the truth. Is the best boss that I've ever had, and I'm really grateful for being my boss. And my colleagues at USB and the economics department, you have really been not only colleagues but as friends, and I've really enjoyed working with you. I, I can walk to any office. I don't think there's anybody in that uh, USB that I cannot enter his office and we can chat and we talk. It is really a wonderful environment. I really appreciate that. So thank you very much for making my life very pleasant at USB. And my students, one thing that I, I have taught for many years before joining USB, but the truth of the matter is that I have never enjoyed teaching as much as I do at USB. When I go to the class, I'm going to the class to learn new things for my student. So I look forward to going to teach my student. And really, it's something that I cherish very much. So my student, thank you so much. And um, last but not the least, my wife. Philomena. As I say, as I say, behind every successful man, there is a more successful woman. <laughs> Honestly, I could not have achieved anything in my academic career because we started together. I could not have achieved anything without her support. And I really, really appreciate that. And the uh, friends that are here that I did not mention, please, I also appreciate all your support. So thank you very much. Let the best boss speak. <laughs> I think you want a salary rise or something, I'm not sure. Um, uh, Prof. Eugene Klute, uh, Prof. Stan Duplessis, Ms. Arangis, um, uh, colleagues from uh, the University of Stellenbosch, specifically the business school, and obviously the students present here tonight, and also those who follow us on the uh, live streaming. Um, I'm an extremely proud director because I've got staff that have excelled and can carry the reputation of Stellenbosch University uh, and the USB and our faculty wide, wide across this continent and for that matter the world. And we have seen an example uh, of an excellent intellectual at work this evening. I ask you to give our colleague another round of applause. Thank you very much. As a social scientist, uh, I was intrigued by this evening, uh, uh, well, I think economics is in fact a social science, and I hope my dean will agree. <laughs> they try to make it something empirical, but we know we can never describe human choices in statistics. It's too variable. That's why we can never predict the markets. And I love that idea because it, it's the mystery of the human person that we need to protect. But two things uh, struck me this evening, uh, Meshach, if I may say so. Firstly is that you clearly show that the work of academics is to break through ideological viewpoints. It's no use to say I'm a Washington person or a, I, I believe in Adam Smith as if that is a clear ideology and then apply the ideology in all cases. It simply leads to disaster because it doesn't leave you with enough flexibility. And you've proven to us that if one carefully evaluates policy, you get enough evidence to evaluate the efficacy of that policy so that if required, you need to make changes. The second thing that I really appreciate is towards the end, when you said that you have now demonstrated the importance of the financial system. The question is not whether it's important, but whether it delivers for us the results. You've showed us the three phases of the policy paradigms in Africa. You develop your own view on the very complex relation between the public and the private sector. And I saw our vice rector and our dean nodding when you spoke about the missing middle because they deal with the fees must fall, also the missing middle. 
But what was for me uh, really encouraging is your last paragraph where you said, I've done empirical work, I can do certain demonstrations in terms of statistics and economic growth, but the answer will never be found once and for all. This is a continuous process. And what I really appreciate is that our course in development finance that really draws really, really, really superb students from around the continent uh, is in fact to equip our students with that ability. The ability to, in a specific country, I know you were struggling tonight to make the general, generalizations because really Angola is different from Somali and Somali is different from South Africa, but to teach them the ability to take wise decisions in a specific context based on the evidence. If we can get that right in Africa, I think we are far way towards realizing the dream for this continent expressed in the 2063 vision that the African Union has recently uh, pronounced. So thank you very much for that. We appreciate you as our colleague and we wish you a long uh, and pleasant uh, link with Stellenbosch University. Do not look at any other office because then a good boss can turn into a very bad <laughs> boss. Thank you. So thank you very much. Um, colleagues, that brings us to the end of the formal activities. I'm now a little bit disorientated because they changed the venue. Is there still something to eat and drink, uh, 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 Mr. Dean? It's, it's going to be up on the second floor. Uh, on this building? It's yeah. In this building, second floor. Okay. And can I ask that our uh, esteemed colleague just stand at the door and let people just congratulate you as you go out? With that, I invite you uh, at the cost of the Dean's budget to uh, enjoy some refreshments <laughs> uh, at the second floor. Thank you very much. Appreciate it.